good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to our Pass the Torch lecture series. We are glad you are here, and we are honored to have Dr. Colleen Wilson-Hodge here tonight. So I'm going to read of her biography to discuss and sort of open up with her accolades and her current research here at Marshall Space Flight Center. Dr. Colleen Wilson-Hodge is an astrophysicist, specifically a gamma-ray astronomer with Marshall Space Flight Center. As lead of the Fermi Gamma Ray Burst Monitor Team, Wilson Hodge was part of the group that recorded the first joint detection of gravitational and light waves from colliding neutron stars. Detection of the gamma radiation and subsequent gravitational wave earned Wilson Hodge's GBM team the 2018 Rossi Prize for Advances in Astrophysics. Dr. Wilson is a native of Tennessee and holds a master's degree in physics and doctorate in astrophysics from the University of Alabama, Huntsville. She began working at Marshall Space Flight Center as a co-op student in college and early in her career worked on burst and transient source experiment, BATSI, that launched on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. She attributes her realization that she could work for NASA to an overnight field trip at the US Space and Rocket Center, where she and her school group took a tour of Marshall Space Flight Center. So tonight, let's all welcome Dr. Colleen Wilson-Hodge back to the Rocket Center. Good evening. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and thank you for the organizers for having me here. One thing I wanted to start out by saying is that discoveries like this aren't made by an individual. It's not like in the movies where one scientist has a breakthrough and says, oh, okay, I figured all of this out. No, it takes a team. It takes a big team of people. In fact, what I'm going to talk about today started out, uh, our group here in Huntsville is about 20 people. And these 20 people worked with people from all over the world. And one of the papers we were on had 3,500 people on it, 3,500 co-authors. So it's an amazing discovery, and it involves much of astrophysics. OK, I'm not used to talking to this big a screen. So I'm going to tell you today, um, I'm going to introduce a lot of things to try to get you to the point where you can understand what I'm telling you about. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about gravity. And I'm going to talk about gravitational waves and tell you what they are. And then I'm going to talk about light. And light is not, not the bright light, just the bright lights that you see shining in my eyes right now. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. And I'll tell you what gamma ray bursts are and how they relate to gravitational waves. And then this event that I had this great picture of, well, artist conception um, at the beginning, this happened on August 17th last year. And I'll tell you about that day and all of the observations that took place and what has happened since then. And then I'll tell you what we learned from this. So what is gravity? Uh, we learn in school that it's forces pulling on things. But Albert Einstein showed us that that's not quite the case, especially when you're talking about large masses. Gravity, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, which came out in 1916, is actually saying that mass distorts space. So it mass bends space. And what you're seeing here is a depiction of the Earth orbiting the sun. And the Earth is orbiting the sun not because the sun is pulling on it, but because the sun is bending the space around it. And the Earth is going around that curved space. <laughs> so gravity is space being curved. It's not just forces. And that becomes important when we're talking about gravitational waves and how all this works. So gravity bends space. And if you have the mass and it's moving, then it produces gravitational waves. 
you need quite a bit of mass to actually produce detectable gravitational waves. Uh, you need things like merging black holes at the top or merging neutron stars. And what that does is it doesn't just move the black holes and the neutron stars, it moves everything, it moves all of the space. So there's a cartoon here of the Earth being stretched and squished, kind of a large scale idea of the gravitational waves going by and making the Earth ripple. It doesn't happen that large, actually gravitational waves are the size of half the diameter of a proton. Um, it's very, very tiny motions that we're measuring here. So how do we measure them? We measure them with the world's most precise rulers. Now, there are three gravitational wave observatories right now. There are two that are the LIGO observatories in the US. LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer Gamma, uh, not, not Gamma Ray, that's what I'm used to G's being, Gravitational Wave Observatory. And Virgo is in Italy. And what these do is use very precise measurements of the length of the two arms to see the changes of the gravitational waves coming through. And the way that that works, think about it this way. Okay, so I've actually been to Livingston. It's in Louisiana. It's about seven hours from here. I can measure the distance to it by the clock in my car. I know it takes about seven hours to drive there and seven hours to drive back. And we can use very precise clocks to measure the gravitational waves. You know, if this works, yep, here we go. So this is the lasers going back and forth in those arms. And when the gravitational waves jiggle the arms, the distance in one of them is a little bit different than the distance in the other. And we can measure that to very, very high precision. And we can do that because the speed of light is constant. So speaking of light, what is light? You're used to thinking of light as being the lights that we see, but there's an awful lot of light that we cannot see with our eyes. In fact, the majority of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum, it's something we can't see with our eyes. So blown up here, you have the regular rainbow going from red to violet. If you go down below red, you get infrared. Our eyes can't see that, but that's heat. You can see that with um, night vision goggles or something like that. Below that is radio waves, and those are what carry the signals if you're using an, an old-style TV antenna. That's how you get the signals from the TV to your house. Ultraviolet is bluer than blue, or more violet than violet. Um, that's a color of light, and X-rays and gamma rays are higher energy colors of light that continue above the violet. Now, on this part of the spectrum, we can't see that from down on Earth. We have to be in satellites to see them. Uh, the radio waves we can see from Earth, and infrared we can as well, along with the visible. So when you're observing the universe in light, we use telescopes. And if you think of a telescope, probably the picture in your mind is this one an optical telescope, a typical backyard sort of telescope. But all of these are telescopes. Um, they're all different kinds of telescopes. This is the infrared, uh, this is an infrared observatory in Hawaii. This is the Hubble Space Telescope, which actually can observe from infrared to visible to ultraviolet, depending on which instrument you're picking. This is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. But all of these look more or less like telescopes when you think of telescope. But you get to the two ends of the spectrum, the radio waves and the gamma rays, and the, spec the telescopes start in looking a bit different. Um, that looks more like a satellite dish, and that looks like a, bo a box or something. So we measure gamma rays from space, and we measure it using the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. You see it here inside the, the shroud before launch. And this is the launch on the Delta II Heavy in June of 2008. So we're almost to the 10th birthday of Fermi. And I'll show you a website at the end here that um, we're celebrating the 10th year of Fermi. We're celebrating all year long. And if you look on Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr for Fermi at 10, you'll find all kinds of stories um, about all of the great science Fermi is doing. So 
The specific instrument that I work on, and the one that observed the gamma rays from this event, is the Fermi Gamma Ray Burst Monitor. You see me standing here by the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope. This was before launch when we were testing out in Arizona. Uh, these are the GBM detectors. That's three of them there. Um, this is one of our higher energy detectors. You see them off to the side. Um, so these are lower energy detectors. Um, for those who like numbers, they're sensitive from 8 keV to 1 MeV. Uh, a chest X-ray is about 25 keV. Uh, these are the BGO detectors, which are more energetic. We only have two of them. We have 12 of these. And these are pointed all different directions so we can see the whole sky. So these detectors are scintillators. They work much differently than a regular telescope. We don't have mirrors bending light. Instead, what happens is a gamma ray comes in, hits this material that's called a scintillator, and basically knocks off an electron and makes a flash of light. Then the photomultiplier tube detects that light and amplifies it into counts that go into our computer and we store them. So we don't make pictures, we make counts, and counts versus time. And you'll see plots of that in a minute. Now, I talk about viewing the whole sky. This is a cool animation my colleague Adam Goldstein made. Uh, all of those gray dots are the GBM detectors looking at different parts of the sky. The big blue, stri blue thing, this thing over here, is the Earth, where it blocks the sky, where GBM can't see. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is that on a map of the sky, the way that we can figure out where the gamma rays come from is by looking at how the counts we see in individual detectors compare to what we expect from a particular direction. And we find the direction that looks the most like what we see. So okay, that's about, that tells you about the gamma ray burst monitor and gives you a little bit of an idea of how it works. So what are gamma ray bursts? Gamma ray bursts are the biggest explosions in the universe. Um, they are when a black hole is born. And We've learned that there are two types of them. Uh, there are, they are long gamma ray bursts and short gamma ray bursts. And the long gamma ray bursts are, are produced when you have a very large star exploding and forming a black hole. And that's this case, although there's, this says something about a red giant, which is wrong, but I like the graphic otherwise. Um, so what happens is a star explodes, forms a black hole, and a jet comes out. And when the jets come out, we see the gamma rays, and that's the gamma ray burst. These can happen in any part of the sky at any time. They're coming from the distant universe. The other type of gamma ray burst, oh, yeah, I should point this out. The long gamma ray bursts look something like this in the data, although there's lots of variations in how they look, but they last tens to hundreds of seconds, usually. Short gamma ray bursts are a bit different. Uh, they happen when you have two neutron stars, which are two very dense stars that I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, they're orbiting each other and they merge and collide and form a black hole that way. And they do the same thing of forming the jets. But the signal is much shorter. Uh, part of the reason for that is because there's a lot less stuff there to make, make the gamma rays. So this is another image of it depicting gamma ray bursts kind of what happens after. So these are the two scenarios. So you have the large star exploding, making a black hole, or the merging neutron stars. This is the jet that's coming out. And this jet is traveling at close to the speed of light. And as it collides with itself, it makes gamma rays immediately as the, almost immediately as the black hole is formed. And then as the jet continues out into the interstellar medium and starts colliding with the interstellar medium, then you begin to see what's called an afterglow, and we're see, we see it glowing in optical light, x-rays, radio waves, all across the spectrum. But the gamma rays happen quickly and first. So a, this is a neutron star. You get a neutron star when a star quite a bit larger than our sun explodes and collapses down. It doesn't collapse enough to be a black hole but it collapses to the densest matter that there is. It's so dense, in fact, that you've seen, you've seen drawings of atoms, probably, where the electrons are kind of going around the nucleus. Well, these, in a neutron star, they're squished. 
So everything is essentially neutrons. So there's no space between the nucleus of the atom and the electrons. And this is the densest matter there is, and it's neutron pressure that holds it up. Anything denser is going to collapse into a black hole. Um, what this is actually showing you here is giving you an idea of the size of a neutron star. This is the island of Manhattan. So this star is about 12 miles across. I can run that far. Um, but it has the mass of the sun crammed into about 12 miles. So it's incredibly dense. Okay, so now on to what happened on August 17th. So what you just heard and saw there was the events of August 17th. So down here on the bottom, this is the gravitational wave signal. This is the frequency that is measured from those two stars spinning around each other and then merging. So you hear them speed up. You heard the sound go whoop and speed up as they merged. So this is the time of the merger. 1.7 seconds later, we have a gamma ray burst. It's not something we, ha we had a measure of before, so we have some idea now from this event. It took 1.7 seconds. Exactly what happened in those 1.7 seconds, we don't have that information, so it's, it's some measure of how long it takes, and now the theorists are, are having fun figuring out exactly what causes that. So let me tell you a little bit of the story of this day. Um, so here in Huntsville, um, the gamma ray burst monitor sends us signals to our phones. So our phones go off and say, okay, we got a trigger. What that means is that GBM saw a gamma ray burst. That happens about once a day. And a lot of the triggers aren't very interesting. Um, we catalog them, we keep track of them. It's important to study them as an ensemble to understand what all of them are doing together. Uh, but individual ones often aren't that exciting. And, and this one was kind of puny. Um, so we got, a, we got a signal to our phones 14 seconds after this happened. We didn't know about the gravitational waves yet. But people looked at the signal said, yeah, kind of puny gamma ray burst. And then a bit later, we got an email from one of our colleagues that said, wake up, this gamma ray burst has a friend. And what had happened was LIGO had seen something in, in one of their detectors, um, but in the other, it had a big noise glitch. So with a big noise glitch, none of their automatic stuff worked. So GBM was very important in this because our satellite automatically sent a signal after 14 seconds. And that made LIGO go look at their data more quickly. And then all of the events unfolded from there. Um, because they found it, they found the signal definitely there. They were e a easily able to clean up the noise signal um, and measure the gravitational waves from this event. This was the first, first detection of gravitational waves from merging neutron stars. Uh, there have been several detections of merging black holes, including the one on my dress. Um, and this was also the first detection of gamma rays and merging neutron stars. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that both of these, both, these are the two independent detections of this event. Everything else that I'll show you later was follow on. Before I showed you the, the map on the sky of the detectors looking at the sky. So this pink circle is where GBM localized the event to have come from. By looking at the, the ratios of the count rates between the different detectors, we know that it came from somewhere in that circle. This little green splotch here, that is how, that is where LIGO and Virgo localized it too. Now, this cool thing about this is that um, the Virgo in Italy did not see this event and that actually made the localization better because it only has a small blind spot and so they knew that it had to be in the blind spot. And if you can just barely see it, there's a little star there, that's marking the location of the optical counterpart that I'll tell you about in a few more minutes. So this is another look at the gamma ray burst and the gravitational wave. 
So you have the gravitational wave here at the bottom. And this is the short burst signal. And you may remember it looks quite a bit like that one that I showed you earlier, just a quick spike. But if you look at lower energies in GBM still, it looks a bit different. It lasts a little longer. So what we don't know about this event is, is this part there for many of them, a few of them? This was kind of a weak burst, and it's definitely gotten much, much more scrutiny than the other weak bursts. So we're looking through our data to find other ones like this. Uh, because for the bright ones, we hadn't noticed anything like that. So I talked before about short bursts and long bursts. What this is showing you is a count of the number of all the bursts versus time. These are all the bursts that GBM has seen. And if you do it that way, counting them up, you get two bumps. So this is the long burst bump, and it's centered on about 30 seconds. And this is the short burst bump, centered on about a little below a second. Um, and this event falls right here, which is in the short burst bump. So we can identify it as a short burst, and it's not out of, it's not out, not out of the ordinary. It's a longish short burst, but it's not anything unusual. Where it becomes unusual is when we use the fact that from the gravitational waves, they can measure the distance, and from the optical observations as well. The distance is about 130 million light years away. The, this is showing you brightness versus distance for gamma ray bursts. Most of the bursts fall in here, and this is the August 17th event. It was about a thousand times fainter than anything else we've seen. So it's the closest one and the faintest. And that was a surprise. What we don't know is there's a gap here. Um, and as I've said a few times, this event wasn't that exciting to us by itself. So there may be lots of things that we didn't look at more closely, that we didn't follow up, that could have fallen in this stretch. Obviously, we want to look more with gravitational waves and gamma ray bursts. So we don't know yet if this event was special. So why was it so faint? So what this is showing you is kind of a schematic. Remember I showed you the, the gamma ray burst with the jet coming out. So here's a very simple picture of it where you have a uniform core. So that jet is just kind of a uniform thing. It's not, it's the same all the way across. And if you're looking off to the edge, you can't really see it very well. If instead the jet has some structure to it, think about like a flashlight beam. And if you're shining your flashlight, it's bright in the middle and fainter out on the edges. So if the, this gamma ray burst looks something more like that, then you could get a fainter edge if we're looking down the edge. The other possibility is that you have something called a cocoon, which is more of a spherical emission around the whole thing, and possibly one of these jets together. Uh, we can't quite tell which one it is. Um, some of the later observations think they can, maybe if they keep observing for several, several more months. It's still undecided. Okay, so this fun little cartoon, I'll let it play, shows the gravitational waves and the gamma ray burst, seeing the, the gravitational waves felt by the Earth, and the gamma ray burst seen by Fermi. Now, the cool thing about this is both of these things traveled 130 million light years, and they got here 1.7 seconds apart. If you do the math, you find out that the speed of light and the speed of gravity are the same to within one part in one quadrillion. So they're the same. Um, that's something that was not measured to anywhere near that precision before. And that's something that Einstein predicted. So he was right. So the things that we've learned from this, we've learned that the speed of gravity and the speed of light are the same. Um, we've learned something about the interior of neutron stars, what they're made of. Um, from these measurements, you can, we have something called the equation of state for neutron stars. And that's telling you how the mass and the radius of the neutron star is related to each other. And basically the fluffiest ones have been ruled out by this measurement. And fluffy is a technical term. So we're learning things about the jets in the gamma ray bursts and 
we can estimate that we will see about one, of the, one event like this per year with LIGO and GBM when they're both operating. So the thing I want to go on to tell you about quickly is what happened over the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum. So I told you about what happened right there in the beginning in the first two seconds. Um, the rest of the day, and for days beyond that, this event was observed by six um, space-borne observatories and more than 70 ground-based observatories across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. This has got some nice music. So here you see the neutron stars going around each other. Then they merge. Gamma rays come out, gravitational waves. And this is that cocoon that I mentioned. And this is the afterglow, the part of the jet. So I'll show you a little bit about the observations that took place. Um, so right when the gravitational waves and the gamma rays were detected, um, no one could look at it in the optical once we had a good enough location. There were a few reasons why. There were 43 galaxies that were potential places where this was in the error circle. And it wasn't dark anywhere somebody could look at it with telescopes. So 11 hours later, um, it was dark in South America, and they started looking at this with telescopes. And simultaneously, six telescopes saw it. It's, you can see this little dot in lots of these pictures. The dot, basically what they do is they compare, and the dot wasn't there before. And this is the signature of what is called a kilonova. And a kilonova is cool because it's how most of the heavy elements, like gold and platinum, are formed. Um, from this event, it's estimated that about 5% of the sun's mass in heavy elements were formed. So you could find a lot of gold if you could get 130 million light years away. Now, in x-rays, you may remember in the beginning I talked about that x-ray afterglow. Um, usually we see that fairly soon after the gamma ray burst. And this satellite, the Neil Garrell Swift Observatory, uh, got on this event very quickly. Um, unfortunately, they were trying to look over the whole GBM error box, which was pretty big, so immediately they weren't looking in quite the right place. But once they got the optical observations, they went and looked at that spot. And they didn't see x-rays, even though we would have thought they would, but they saw a bright UV source. And that was a bit of a surprise. That was something that the models had not predicted. Uh, these are Hubble images of the fading kilonova over several days as this went on. So that goes from August 22nd to August 28th. This is Spitzer last September. And then in x-rays, it was observed with Chandra, and nine days after the event, they found the x-ray counterpart. And it continued, it was brightening, not fading. In fact, this is a plot that I, I got very recently. This is from observations earlier this month. So this is brightness versus time. And these are the x-rays getting brighter until about 160 days after the event. This is 260 days after the event, um, May 5th, or 4th or 5th, I believe it was. They observed it. It's just starting to fade now, but it's still there. Um, so we can st still see the x-rays from this event. Um, they're, they're saying if we can still watch it for many more days, um, they might be able to start to distinguish between that structured jet and the cocoon, um, the two different scenarios I showed. But we don't know yet, we'll see. So what have we learned from this event? So one of the predictions was that short duration gamma ray bursts are produced by merging neutron stars and here we have the measurement of that. We have the merging neutron stars measured in gravitational waves and the short gamma ray burst together. So we know that that is true, that's predicted. Uh, the speed of gravity equals the speed of light, and like I explained, these two things got here 1.7 seconds apart after traveling 130 million light years, so that we now know that within one part in one quadril quadrillion, 
um, those two things are equal. And that's much better measurement than anyone has ever been able to make before. Um, the aftermath of this event makes heavy elements like gold and platinum, and we have the signature of that in the optical and infrared. Um, it was a bit of a surprise that the X-ray and the radio emission didn't really show up until more than a week later, and then they've continued to get brighter until, um, actually, that should be 160 days after the merger. Lots of things about this were unexpected, though. Um, I, it, LIGO ha, people had predicted that maybe they'd see a neutron star merger during this last time that they were on. They really didn't believe it, though. Um, so. Seeing one this time when they were less sensitive than they thought means maybe there's more of these than we thought. Uh, we'll have to see when they turn back on again. Um, so I showed that the gamma ray bursts are coming. The gamma ray bursts are coming out in kind of a beam. They're coming out in a cone. Um, so we we'll only see the ones that are pointed at us, or so we think. But not only did we see the first merger of two neutron stars in gravitational waves, but we also saw it in gamma rays. So does that mean there's more of those, too? Um, does that mean we can see more fainter ones? Um, this event was very dim, even though it was the closest on record. Normally, you'd think it's close by, so it'd be brighter. Um, that may or may not be a surprise, because if you think about it, if you go out and look at lights at night, you can see more dim lights close to you than far away. You just can't see the ones that are dim and far away. Um, the X-ray afterglow, it rose instead of fading. And that ultraviolet counterpart was completely unexpected. So I want to show you, as I'm finishing up here, um, the truly completely unexpected. So the first unambiguous detection of gravitational waves and gamma rays was the August 17th event. But back in September 2015, we had a head scratcher of an event. Two black holes were detected merging by LIGO. These are the black hole merger signals. They look a little different. And you might recognize these two if you look at what I'm wearing. Um, I, my dress has these signals in a cool plaid pattern on them. Um, so this is the merger of two black holes. 0.4 seconds after, GBM saw something. But the problem is, is that at that point, LIGO couldn't locate it very well. It was kind of over there in the sky. Uh, GBM, because it was really bad geometry for us, said it was kind of over there in the sky. So it's, the error boxes are like huge parts of the sky. They do overlap, but the chances of it being coincidence are not trivial, so we don't know. So we want to keep looking for more events like this to see if, indeed, black holes produce gamma rays too. You wouldn't expect it because there's not enough matter there, but maybe they do. We're going to keep looking. So this is the uh, website for Fermi at 10, because there's a whole lot more exciting science that Fermi does, much more than gamma ray bursts. Um, and if you want to read about it, you can go to this website, and you can find how to follow it on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. And there's going to be lots of things happening over the next year. There will be um, lots of cool things happening on the web um, around June 11th, our launch anniversary as well. Thank you.